underwriting deals is such a major pain point for people. Most don't want to do it, and the people that are good at it are few and far between. That is why after six years of being in the industry and buying over 1,200 apartments using my best-selling multifamily deal analyzer, I created Real Estate Lab, a full suite acquisition software for multifamily investors. We have built a product that helps investors automate their acquisitions and close more deals all in a cloud-based platform. You can go to realestatelab.com and sign up today using the promo code TAG2 for 10% off your first 12 months. This is David Tupin. Thanks for listening. Welcome to the Apartment Gurus, where we dive deep into all things multifamily investing. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and empower real estate investors to reach their highest potential. Each week, host Tate Seamer and co-host Chelsea Garber interview high-level guests from all over the industry who are sure to bring valuable, actionable ideas that will propel your business to the next level. Whether you're just starting out or a seasoned investor, you are in the right place. And now your hosts, the Apartment Gurus. Tate Seamer and Chelsea Garber. Welcome everybody back to another episode of The Apartment Gurus. And today we are being visited by a friend of our company and a, uh, a go-getter who's uh, really like accomplishing big things in this space right now and is fun and exciting to follow. Uh, Mr. Joshua Ferrari is with us. Josh, I'm super excited to have you back on the show. You, you are like one of maybe four guests in 110 episodes that I've had on the show twice now. Oh, sweet. I'm special. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you are special. You're, abs- you're absolutely special. We don't invite the, the, the mediocre guests back. You've contributed a lot to us in terms of, you, you know, you, you, you were kind of like, I, I've always felt like you're maybe just a, kind of a step or two or three ahead of where we are. And, and, um, you know, you're fun to follow on social media because number one, you just, you post really meaningful thought provoking stuff, but number two, you're just getting it done, man. You're like, you're closing deals and and left and right. And and at least it feels that way. And as we're in this shifting market, you and I were just talking a little offline about how your deal flow has actually picked up and it's gotten kind of crazy. And I'm excited to jump into all this with you. Um, I guess to get us started, uh, you know, listeners go back and listen to the episode uh, with Joshua from last year, I believe it was, uh, and probably, probably last fall, I think is when we, we, we talked last. Um, but you know, Josh's, um, his, his bio, his background is all going to be uh, really well covered in that uh, in that episode, so we won't do too much of a deep dive into your background, uh, you know, before the last podcast. But I definitely want to catch up with you, kind of on the last, you know, six to nine months or so in the business, and um, you know, what have you guys been able to accomplish it and and uh, to accomplish, and and you know, how are things going? Yeah. Uh, wow. What an intro. <laughs> good, good to be here, man. Happy to be back on the show round two. Yeah, uh, man. What I've done since fall, it's been so many things. I'm trying to, I can't remember where our portfolio was last fall. Um, but we've closed a handful of deals since then. I don't know if we closed this yet or not last fall, but we closed 88 units in, um, uh, October of last year. That was in Montgomery, Alabama. Then in January, we closed 110 units in Austin, Texas. And then in June of this year, so just last month, we closed 207 units in Southern Mississippi. Nice. Um, And we've got a 150-unit RV park development deal under contract in Southern Mississippi that was direct-to-seller, owner-financed, 4% interest, 30-year amortization it's great um and then we've also got a 300 acre parcel of land under contract in franklin tennessee which is 30 minutes south of nashville and that'll actually be a high-end luxury like neighborhood community slash social club development oh nice Uh, very very interesting single family structures or that particular one will be single family yeah we're partnering with a developer that that's all they've done for 30 plus years and they're local to the area and uh we're just kind of riding the coattails, bringing, bringing the capital and riding the coattails. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, that's exciting. So if I'm if my math is serving me well, you've got about you've closed over 400 doors this year so far, 400 units and 150 in the pipe uh, with the RV park. Does that sound about right? Yeah, and yeah. then we've got like three or four other deals we put offers on, um, but this is just LOI phase. That, yeah. That'll be that's probably another 30 million plus. Um, if we were to get all of them, which I'm sure we won't, but well, you, you might, you, yeah, you gotta, know. you gotta play the game, you know, that's it's, right. it's just a numbers game <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, for listeners, like they say, you got to underwrite a hundred deals for every deal that you get. I don't think that our business has reflected that, but it's probably, you know, at least half that, that we underwrite, um, as far as, you know, doing the deep dive underwriting and getting the spreadsheet populated and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, for, the four deals that Josh has gotten going this year and, and, and are, you know, working on the one and got the other three, like you've probably underwritten a ton of deals this year. Would, would you say? Dude, just in the last two weeks, I've probably underwritten like 50 deals. Wow. Okay. Let, let's talk about this. So, and that's, that's the broker relations game that's serving you in that way. That's all brokers. Yeah. Some of the, of course, some of the broker deals that they're sending me are quote unquote off market. Uh, some they've already listed or they're getting ready to list it. So it's like a pocket listing. Um, right. No, right. no, no direct to seller. Yeah. Uh, are you guys doing direct to seller still? No, we, yeah. uh, we never, we're not doing any marketing for direct to seller. We've only closed one deal that was direct to seller. It was the first deal we ever did. And that was because it was my mentor's deal. Okay. Um, and yeah. then we've got the RV park deal was direct to seller, mm-hmm. uh, but that was literally like the most flukiest, crazy <laughs> conversation and, and opportunity that just presented itself. I, I called six people, six RV parks, because we were thinking about buying another RV park mm-hmm. in the same area. And so I was posing as a someone with an RV calling different RV parks in the area, wanting to know what's the seasonality like, what are the rents like? Um, you know, is there any downtimes? What kind of amenities do you have? Just trying to scope out the competition, so to say. Yeah. And the sixth guy I called somehow grabbed on to the fact that I was not someone with an RV and that I was looking to buy an RV park somewhere. I have no he idea how, out. how he figured that out, yeah. but yep. um, he told me about this other piece of land that he had. He was hmm. 74 years old. Told me about this other piece of land he had that he'd been, cause he had for like five years and he's wanted to turn into an RV park to add to his already RV park that I was calling him about. And he's like, I'm just too old. I don't have time. I don't want to worry about it anymore. I'm like, Oh, would you be interested in selling? And he's like, you know what? I would, because it's just sitting there not doing anything. Uh, might as well put it to good use. I'd love for it to like become an RV park already hmm. zoned for it and everything. And it used to be a mobile home park. So it had all the infrastructure of a of an RV park. Anyway, wow. getting on a tangent. But no, he ended I, up saying good. he ended up saying yes, he wanted to sell it. He had a number in mind immediately on that call. And then we worked uh, we worked owner financing in the call as well. So he was willing to owner finance 51% of it uh at a four percent interest rate, 30 year amortization, 10 year term. So was that your idea or his? The owner financing? Yeah. That was my idea of bringing it up. And yeah. then he didn't even bat an eye. He said, absolutely, I'd be willing to do that wow. because that's how I bought it. Wow. Okay. So he he already had his head around this concept. Yeah. It, it's it's not always the easiest conversation to have with a seller. Um, and I'll be I'll be honest with you. Like as of yet, we really have yet to uh work the, you know, the subject to seller financing concept into our sales and or into our acquisitions. And, um, and a lot of that is because we're buying deals that are either on market or kind of barely off market where there's still other players at the table. And we're, we've been in a seller's market where everybody's looking to really cash out. But if you present this idea well, and you, you present it in a way that is easy for sellers to understand this can be a tremendous tool uh, for getting deals done that you otherwise might not be able to, or even paying more uh, for a deal than you otherwise might be able to. I mean, a 4% uh, loan is, is tremendous in this environment. That's two points lower than just about than anything else you're going to get. 
Right. Um, and it allows you to maybe pay a little more or, uh, you know, kind of stretch some other parts of the deal. So um, do you have the seller finance conversation a lot, Josh? Um, if I'm talking directly to the seller, uh, I guess, depending on where the conversation's at, depending on their need to sell, that'll depend on whether or not I bring it up. Um, but at the same time, if it's like, hey, look, this deal's not going to make sense. And the only way it's going to make sense, the only way I'm going to be able to get close to your purchase price is if we start introducing some more creative financing. Um, and I'll start opening up the floor for, you know, what is your loan assumable is, is, would you consider holding a piece of it back? Like, uh, we're going to need about, you know, whatever it is, $5 million to close this deal. Would you consider owner financing just the 5 million and you'll get the rest of it at closing. Yeah. Uh, so then it's like a no money down deal. Uh, just trying to get a little creative with it. And that just comes from the experience of understanding how, you know, how the debt cycle and how the, how all those different things work so that you can be educated when you're having these conversations. Yeah. One technical question just popped into my head. I thought I'd ask is, is it challenging to get a, a first position lender? Okay. With a, uh, with a seller finance note on, on, in the second position. Uh, as long as the bank is first position, they're not really too worried about who's okay. in second, third or whatever. Cause they know they've, they're really holding the keys. Um, yeah. so second position doesn't matter too much to them, or you could even do like a promissory note or a personal guarantee. If the seller is really antsy and doesn't really want to be in second position, you could do something, something along those lines. Um, that's actually what we're going to do with the RV park. He's going to be in second position and we're still working out the details of whether or not he wants us to personally guarantee that, but he'll be in second position. Yeah. So since there won't be any first position, we're going to utilize the value of the land to get a construction loan to actually build mm -hmm. out what we need for the development of the RV park. Yeah. And then for that, like the deal, getting it under contract, like actually the process of that, he didn't require us to put any earnest money down. Nice. No due diligence time frame. Wow. just limitless get, you know, get it done when you get it done. Just one of those like, good old boy kind of handshake conversations of like, mm -hmm. Hey, we, we've got it under contract. That's legal. But I mean, he could care less to follow uh, the majority of li like the timelines and stuff like that. He's like, look, just get it done when you need to get it done. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's called creative financing for a reason, like going, doing this sort of thing is, you know, when you're dealing with a lender, an institutional lender, they dictate the terms of the loan. Like, there's not negotiation really at all. Um, you know, they, they tell you exactly what they're going to do and, and they either will do it for you or if you say no, they won't. But, um, you know, with, I mean, there, listen, there were like, it seemed like there were three or four or five different aspects of the seller finance note that are, you know, fully like negotiable, customizable, and like the personal guarantee and the interest rate and uh, the due diligence period, like you can really set things up for yourself as a buyer, uh, you know, very strategically in order to uh, make things work. And like, like Joshua said a little earlier, like it, it allows you to maybe get into the price range that the seller wants uh, where you, otherwise you might not be able to. So it can be a great win-win. And, you know, this is like fully, even though this is an RV park, you could be, do the exact same thing on a, uh, on a multifamily asset. Um, yeah. that's, that said, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, stream of consciousness, but when you're dealing with brokers, like you and I both are, we, we have a very similar model, uh, in terms of where we source deals. Um, it's, it's not certainly not impossible or non-existent that a seller will carry a note. Um, but it's, it's a little different. Like the, the seller's gone to the broker thinking that they're going to likely cash out a hundred percent. And so to introduce a, a, a note option, um, you know, can, can work. Have you done that? Have you, have you brought like a, in a broker deal? Have you brought, uh, the, the possibility of a seller finance note into the conversation? I've brought that up with a couple of different brokers, depending on the deal. And more often than not, they're like, they either just kind of shrug their shoulders and they're like, ah, probably not. He probably won't be interested. Yeah. Or if they're serious about it and they, 
really want to represent me and represent the seller and pro- actually produce every offer that's given, then they'll actually go back to the seller and have that conversation and then come back with me with a more definitive yes or no, instead of just thinking that they they wouldn't agree to it. And I think now more than ever, especially as we progress over the next six to 12 months, the whole concept of creative financing is really going to start to expand. Yeah, uh, And you're going to see a lot more creative opportunities and I think more lucrative opportunities because we're kind of weeding out a lot of those players that are, I guess, scared. Uh, they're mm-hmm. doing the opposite of what Warren Buffett says, you know, be yeah. fearful when others are greedy and greedy, greedy when others are fearful. Yeah. Um, but as far as the seller financing goes with brokers, I actually literally had a broker send me a deal today and he was like off market deal, you know, in, in your target market, hmm. give gave me all the bullet points. And then the, with a little story, he basically said sellers like sellers hurting need to sell ASAP, you know, on, on a crunch timeline and would consider uh, seller financing. And mm. then he had like terms in there of what mm. would be included with the seller financing. And wow. I ended up, I analyzed the deal and it didn't end up making sense regardless because they just want too much money. But it was, it's definitely starting to be something that brokers are having conversations with sellers about. Yeah. And I think if you're a buyer going direct to seller or to brokers in general, it's definitely a conversation that needs to be had with where the lending market is. It's definitely pushing prices to where, I mean, you would want them to be, I guess, in terms, Mm -hmm. if you're the buyer, you want the price lower. Uh, but sellers haven't quite grasped that concept yet of understanding that there has been downward pressure on the market. Because if you think about it, real estate, uh, I heard the analogy, real estate's like a hand grenade market, I think is what they said. And I was like, it's a very interesting analogy. Mm -hmm. Um, But they're like, basically you pull the pin out, chunk the hand grenade, and then like that's happened, the pin's out, the grenade's been launched, but it just hasn't exploded yet. Uh, and so basically what they're saying is everything in real estate is massively delayed. So no seller is going to see that there's 75 basis points higher interest rate and be like, Ooh, I need to drop the price of my asset by $5 million. Right. They're going to wait two, three, four, five, six, ten 10 months of it just chilling on the market, not doing anything before they're like, Hmm, maybe I need to actually move this down a little bit. Maybe I need to change the terms a little bit. Maybe I need to do something. And that's when everything will start really moving in the direction that the government and the Fed is already moving it by trying to soften the market by increasing, Mm -hmm. increasing rates. Yeah, that's a good segue into uh, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, which is, you know, pivoting in this market. We've it's uh, July 22nd is the date of this recording, July 22nd, uh, 2022. And as of today, uh, you know, the last, let's say, four months or so. Uh, maybe you know three to four months it has been extremely volatile for the debt market and uh, the in the commercial real estate space and and you know that's it's kind of a side note that's something that I've never seen before uh, you know where we've got the the Fed raising interest rates by three quarters of a point maybe a point full point next meeting uh, is what they're saying. And while that isn't a direct correlation with mortgage interest rates, it certainly is a a big influencer. So, you know, we've gone, Josh and I have gone from underwriting deals, you know, in the sometimes high threes, low fours uh, for for mortgages, let's say this time last year, um, or this time even six months ago, to, um, you know, if you get something right around a five, you're kind of pretty excited right now. Um, we've actually, we have gotten quotes lower than that recently, but those are small banks. And to your point, Josh, you're right. The interest rates have gone up and are, you think we're about three quarters higher than we were at the beginning of all this? That, that what you, what your estimate is? Um, yeah. I mean, you're saying high threes, low fours, and we're at like five ish percent on the commercial side. I'm not yeah. very involved in the Single family residential, maybe higher with that. But yeah. as far as commercial goes, I, that's what I'm seeing is high fours, low fives. But again, like you said, that's with uh, that's with Fannie Freddie, that's with agencies, that's with some of these larger lenders. Yep. But if you were to go to something like a local bank, then I think you'd be able to get a little bit more favorable terms. And honestly, that's what we were doing 
back before any of this even happened because we couldn't get agency because agency has this weird requirement that you have to have like two years experience of agency to get agency debt. And it's like <laughs> the impossible chicken and egg scenario. Yeah. Well, I don't have two years experience. You won't give it to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we were forced to utilize local banks and those relationships to get our first couple of deals, to start getting our feet wet, to ultimately eventually be able to take those deals and refi them into agency debt, which was going to start to give us that experience. So then potentially in the future, uh, we would be able to get agency debt right off the bat if the deal made sense. But mm -hmm. since we were able to build those relationships early on, and we've had them ever since we've been closing deals, uh, we're starting to utilize those much more significantly now more than ever, because it's almost a it's almost like a criteria. Like it's a necessity at this point. If you're want, if you're wanting to get favorable terms for a new acquisition. Yeah. And the reality is that the banks, the local and regional banks have been slowest to respond to the, these interest rate hikes. So, you know, we got quoted on a loan uh, that we're, that we're going to close. Uh, it's, we probably got quoted um, and, and firmed it up about a month ago. And the rate that we got was 4.625 and which like we were getting all the other quotes we were getting from agency and, and other sources were in the low to mid fives. So, you know, half, half to three quarters of a point lower to go with a bank. And a lot of times the banks are, you know, they'll give you interest only terms uh, or, you know, a few years worth of interest only leverage is not necessarily, you know, we didn't get the best leverage on that loan. We didn't, didn't really get what we wanted, but, um, so, but in, in the way, in the world of interest rates, at least right now, um, banks are a really compelling source to, to go to for these, for these debt programs. Aside from debt, what, what are you seeing in the equity space right now? Are you seeing any, any big changes? As far as equity goes, what I've begun to see is that it's a little bit of a 50, 50 split with specifically just talking about the the private slash passive investor this, mm -hmm. the average joe that's got fifty thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars of capital somewhere either whether it's in the bank whether it's in the stock market it's somewhere and they're starting to see what inflation's doing and yeah. they're getting a little worried about losing all this buying power or if their money was in the stock market they've lost a ton of money and because they've lost a ton of money they don't want to sell yet because they don't want to lose what they could potentially not lose if they didn't pull it out uh, to reinvest it elsewhere. So they're just losing from all angles because they're going to mm -hmm. lose to uh, inflation and they're also losing with where the stock market's at and the overall economy from that regard is at. Uh, so they're getting a little worried and they would like to pull their capital out to invest, but they just don't want to because they're scared. Then yeah. you've got the investor that is seeing what's happening with the with inflation and with the economy. And they're like, hey, look, uh, I don't really know what's going on with the real estate market, not an expert, whatever the case is, but I want to make my money work for me. Like, I don't want it to just sit here and mm -hmm. lose a, a ton of my buying power and all that I've worked so hard for. So there, uh, I think the other 50% is I'm seeing a lot of newer investors or the same investors specifically is what I've seen. Uh, the same of our current investors, they're starting to invest more. So whereas last year they were investing 50,000, 100,000, 200,000, the same guys are coming back to me. And I think, of course, it's because they've invested in some of our deals, they've invested right. in other deals. And so they have more capital to invest, but they're like more, they just desire and want to invest more because of what is happening with the market. They don't want all of that dry powder on them right now. And so a guy that invested $200,000 last year called me up and said, Hey, I got a million, need something to do with it. Uh, and I'm like, I mean, I didn't even know that. I didn't even know you were close to that from yeah. the last conversation that we had. Uh, but so they're starting to loosen up their their pockets and their checkbooks a little bit, realizing that it's better placed in real estate from the benefits they've already seen having invested this previously. And then again, like I was saying on the flip side, there's those newer investors coming in as well that are wanting to learn more about real estate because of what's happening with uh, with the current market. And that's just on the private investor slash right. passive investor side of the house. If I look at the institutional side of the house, I think they're just as bullish as they've always been. They've got yeah. so much money. The last thing they want to do is lose a ton of it to inflation. So mm -hmm. they're buying just as much now as they were before, because even though 
like even back then when the everything was super competitive, mm-hmm. they were the ones buying at the two caps and the three caps and the four caps, which was compressing everything and making it really hard for the average Joe. And so yeah. they're just continuing to do the same thing. Interest rates have fluctuated. Things have moved. They're either taking the capital and trying to get a bank loan or they're saying, just screw it. Let's just pay, buy it in all cash. You know, mm-hmm. we've got the cash. Why not just we're the bank? You know, yeah. and I'm sure the returns may be lesser, but at least our capital will be working for us and we won't be going backwards. Yeah. Yeah. And for listeners here, this this whole hedge against inflation concept is really important to grasp. Um, you know, basically, as as you it makes total sense, right? As as inflation goes up, uh, your rents go up accordingly, and that's in addition to any uh, you know forced appreciation that you're doing on the property through renovations and and improvements. Uh, just there's just going to be natural organic growth in rents due to inflation, and while not to get, not to get overly complicated, cap rates may also go up uh, as people are paying less. Uh, than they were willing to before. However, as as most of you know, your value of that property is based on your net operating income and the cap rate of, of the market. So if cap rates go up, uh, which makes things worth less, but the net operating income also goes up, which makes things worth, worth more, then theoretically, you, you're at least going to be a wash, if not an unvalue, if not uh, if not even higher than than you would have been before, and you know, inflation obviously it's a devaluation of currency. And so, what you do when you when you invest in a multifamily asset or a commercial asset where rents are going up with inflation, that's the hedge, right? That's that's what's important to understand is when you're talking to investors and and potential investors and people that are interested in the business. This particular aspect of what we do is so valuable to investors, and uh, you know it's it's something that you need to be able to under, understand and, and explain in a way that's easy for the the seller to or the, yeah the seller the investor to understand. Um, Josh, one of the things I appreciate about you is you make you know you, you're good at making this stuff relatively easy to understand. You're like you explain it really well, so. Um, so yeah, hopefully I did a decent job at the hedge against inflation concept. Yeah, it made sense to me. Like okay, I, good, I, I good. guess I already kind of knew it, so I don't know. Yeah, we'll have to true, ask yeah. the audience. Well, um, yeah. So what? Uh, okay, so capital markets make total sense. I agree with you on the uh, institutional side that uh, we haven't really seen any change from them in terms of feedback. Um, in terms of their willingness to participate, even in situations where the leverage on the loan is less now, uh, then like you know, it's pretty easy to get seventy to eighty uh, percent LTC before um, this this shift in the interest rates. And now, if you're getting 70, 75, that's really good. And you know, we've got stuff in the sixties um, that we're working on right now, but. And that just means you, you're raising more equity, but we haven't really seen any resistance to that. Even side note, green light, we're really working on our institutional sources as we we're doing 20 to $30 million deals now. And uh, when you have that, you've got a 12, $13 million equity check that, you know, you you need to raise and doing that on the retail side with, you know, your passive investors, that's a heavy lift, man. I, you know, it, it's something I've never, done and going and finding these institutional equity sources with with deals that size uh, can be a great solution. It can be a great win-win. And ideally, you're establishing a long-term relationship with that firm so that they'll participate over and over and over again in future deals, which means you can turn up the volume on your business. You're not limited by how much money you can raise yourself. Um, you've got these deep, deep pockets that are, you know, ideally they're in with you and they, they believe in you and, and are willing to, to, um, to do deals with you on an ongoing basis. Did you, what, what part of your equity, Joshua, do you raise? And, uh, I mean, you're raising all of it, but what, what part are you raising from your passive LP type investors, the 50 to $200,000 level? And, uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I'm assuming that you're doing some institutional equity. Is that, is that true? 
Uh, we're in the process now of trying to build the, I don't want to, I guess I don't want to say trying to build the relationship, but like trying to execute on the relationship that was built to get an institutional investor to actually partner with us on a deal. Um, mm -hmm. All the deals we've done up to date have all been just personal, private capital, all 506B, all just people we know, 100,000, 200,000. And then like I was mentioning, some of our, our investors are starting to come up with larger checks. Uh, they've either gotten return of capital on a deal that we've done or they're doing something else elsewhere and they just have more money that they want to throw at us. So that's okay. what's kind of been able to continue to scale our capacity to do deals, of course, is finding new investors, but then also getting those same investors that we initially had. Now they've got more capital and they just continue to reinvest with us as we grow. Uh, but we've got that one deal, the 300 acre parcel of land in Franklin, just the acquisition alone, forget about the development is $30 million. Mm -hmm. um, and to try to get a bank loan for that, it's going to be uh, pretty convoluted. There's going to be a lot of moving parts, the holding costs is just going to make things confusing and more complex than they need to be. So what we're thinking about doing and what we're probably going to end up doing is just getting some form of an institutional investor to come in, give us the full 30 million for the acquisition. And then they would, of course, get their equity share of the, the acquisition side of the capital stack, because then there's going to be more equity that has to come in to get the construction loan to actually do the development build out that we plan to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. they'll get their share of the total equity stack per rata, what their investment is based on whatever that, that total number is, but just buying the land outright is what we're looking to do. And so $30 million, we've never raised $30 million before. Yeah. Um, and so we could try to go to our, we could try to go to our investors, but I think we would, uh, I think we would tap out somewhere around yeah. 20, 20 million probably. So oh, wow, that's amazing. What, what yeah. we might do instead is, like I said, try to try to partner with an institution, just get one like single check to yeah. come in with that, save the rest of our capital for the other deals that we're doing, because this isn't our target focus either. This new development deal, this mm -hmm. was a flaming opportunity that came came about we didn't want to pass up on it so we're executing on it for a variety of different reasons mostly intangible but also tangible it's the biggest deal we've ever done so obviously we're going to get paid the most that we've ever gotten paid on any deal we've ever done mm -hmm. uh, but our particular model is to hold long term so what we hope to do is take that capital take that experience bring that to other brokers and funnel all that really back into multifamily which is why we'd like to keep our investor database uh dry, so to say, so we can use that equity to continue to do multifamily deals as our developer partner does what they do with the build out of this asset. Mm -hmm. So smart, Josh. So your investor relations game, I mean, you, you just said, you said you thought you could raise 20 million from your, your current, uh, your current pool, dude, that's, that's legit. That's stout. Like, I mean, transparently that's, that's more than what green light could pull off right now. You know, we're doing a $27 million deal. Uh, we're through due diligence and our earnest money's non-refundable. And um, and we're working with a life insurance company to bring uh, 85 to 90% of the required equity. Uh, and then we'll raise the rest or, or, or bring in our own capital for the rest. But, um, you know, if, if you got the ability to raise 20, that's like, that's very impressive. What would you say it has like contributed to your ability to, you know, develop that, that stout of a pool that you could raise that kind of capital for, for one deal. I think social media is my biggest, my biggest asset. Okay. Obviously my, our personality, our drive, our work ethic, level of honesty, referrals go a long way with current investors that are already in your database that have invested with you, even just getting them to draft up a little, like, verbid like verbal referral that's yeah. just in text but what really blows some investors away is if you have those investors actually create little videos mm. create them a little video about a basically a review of you and your company and how it's like the body language the facial expressions the new investor getting to see that person's face they're just i don't want to say blown away i mean some of them are but they're enthralled with this concept and uh being able to actually see them and be like wow okay they they really loved what they did and said they were really honest and blah, blah, blah. And so 
then those new investors are, are more eager to jump in. Yeah. And then, I mean, you and I both have a podcast. Podcast has been yeah. very helpful in terms of just credibility and uh, expansion there. Um, but social media is probably the biggest thing, like growing your brand. So mm-hmm. doing the deals and all the other stuff is important. But then actually go, getting out there and letting people see your story, letting people follow you, try to be as active on social media as possible. Maybe not like annoyingly active. Like I don't want to post seven times a week. Just don't care to. So maybe I'll post three to five times a week. I never mm-hmm. post on the weekends either. It's always okay. weekdays. Okay. Uh, so just try to be on social media when other people are on social media. And granted, some people are on during the weekends, but it's significantly lesser than week, like work weeks. Yeah. And so I try to post like midday or early morning on the work weeks. Um, and I try to post something that's like you said at the beginning of this thought provoking or something very personable that's going on with me and our business and new deals that we're doing and new things that we're seeing and some form of knowledge that the average Joe wouldn't just have that isn't yeah. deeply entrenched in the business. Um, and that just allows for other people to see that you're serious, that you're, cause everyone always says when it comes to investor relations, the number one thing you want to do is you want to stay in front of them. And so yeah. that's one, that's why people started. Uh, that's why a lot of people start podcasts. That's why people do newsletters. That's why people do blog posts. That's why people send out like some form of monthly or weekly email to their investors, just about whatever. Uh, And all that stuff works. It's great. But I'm going to be honest, it just fails in comparison to social media, just Mm. being out there on social media, because then you're in front of your current audience, you're in front of your current investors, and you're in front of a plethora of other investors. I mean, I fully don't understand the LinkedIn algorithm still to this day, um, but it's amazing that I can post something and in a 24 hour time frame, like 50,000 people can see it. And I only have like 4,600 followers. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't understand this, but this is fantastic. Right. So just think about you know, on your email list, if you've only got 300 investors on the email list and you're sending out all these newsletters and all these blog posts, and it's only going to the same 300 people every time, or take that same data, tweak it in just a way to make it a little bit more interesting, make it more personable, connect on a deeper emotional level with your audience and your investor potential investor database on social media, post that out there, tens of thousands of people are getting access to that. And it's just out there forever for everyone to see. Uh, some people are scared by that. They think that all their personal information is going to be out there. And you don't got to say tell everyone all your personal information. But if you can be a personable individual on social media, I think you're you're going to be successful if you're a likable individual that's doing things that a lot of people like want to get involved with you for. That makes mm-hmm. sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a, a couple of really good takeaways there. Number one is be strategic about when you post. Uh, quite frankly, that's not something that I've really been too careful about. Like if I've got an hour of free time on the weekend, I'll put together a post and shoot it out. You know, I get, I get home from a trip you know, from the weekend on Sunday night, I'll, I'll do a post about it and hadn't, hadn't considered that to be honest with you, as far as uh, posting date and time. Also, you know, the mix between the professional posts and your personal posts, like you do a good job with that, with sharing what's up with your family, uh, you know, what you're doing for fun. And then also sharing really high level, um, you know, evaluation of the markets and, you know, how you're doing deals and getting those done. Uh, you know, and for listeners, find Joshua Ferrari on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, and probably Instagram too, I'm assuming. Um, and no, I'm actually, I'm, I am on Instagram, but I don't ever post. So yeah. Facebook and LinkedIn are probably the two best. Okay. Places. These thought leader influencer type folks like, like Joshua are, are great follows for, uh, for, for you to get a feel for like how these guys are doing it and what they're focused on and what matters to them and what, you know, what current events are, are saying to them and that sort of thing. It's, tremendous, uh, learning pro- uh, possibilities around that. So, um, you want to, you, uh, you know, if you're resistant to social media, I kind of get it, but I would urge you to consider that if you're, if you're scared of social media, this might not be the space for you. Cause this is a very public space. Like everybody kind of knows what you're doing and knows who you are and you know, you're partnering with people and uh, you know, this, you're pretty visible really. Um, and you know, I, I 
personally would just encourage everybody to really embrace the power of social media. Uh, listen to some Gary Vaynerchuk, man. Like, like Gary V is, you know, the, the public speaker and author that he he'll tell you to post seven times a day, not seven times a week. Like, you know, he he's hardcore, but yeah. So big takeaway, follow Joshua Ferrari on, on Facebook and LinkedIn. So, okay. Other, other ways that you're pivoting, how, how's your underwriting changed over the last few months? A couple of things. Um, so leverage obviously has changed, whereas mm-hmm. previously you're seeing 75 to 80%, sometimes even 85. We never did a deal at 85% leverage, but that was uh, that was an easy thing to achieve yeah. uh, over the last couple of years. So we're seeing things probably closer to 75 to 65, maybe even 60% LTV, depending on the deal. Yeah. Yeah. And the biggest thing for that isn't necessarily that they just want the leverage to change. Like a lot of people say, well, why are they adjusting the leverage so much? And so, uh, and it's primarily because of the debt service coverage ratio. Yep, yep. So the debt service coverage ratio isn't going to change and yep. because they need to have their safety buffer. Mm-hmm. And the debt service coverage ratio is basically anywhere between 1.2 to 1.3 on average for most lenders. Mm-hmm. And if you don't know what that means, basically what it is, is if I've got $100,000 of, I guess, income coming in on a, annual basis. Uh, I, or no, wait, what am I trying to say? If I was going to have a 1.2 or one, we'll say 1.2 debt service coverage ratio, I would need to be making 120,000. Yeah. If my debt service, um, no, was 100. Yeah. even more than that, even more than that. Cause it's, it's one point, like 1.2 X. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'm getting confused. I'm, I suck at math in my head for those of you that don't know. Uh, I think but anyway, right. I think you have to, I, I think you, uh, the 120 compared to the hundred is, was right. But anyway, yeah, it's your typical bank or lender requirement is like a 1.25 DCR DSCR. And right. uh, yeah, that's like, like you said, when interest rates go up, the DSCR comes down. So, so it's that it's the leverage it's uh, obviously the interest rates changing and you never really know what that's going to be. Uh, still seeing 30 year AM amortizations. I don't see yep. that fluctuating too much, but uh, I think a, a big thing that we're noticing specifically in the Gulf coast, um, and this might be interesting for your listeners, anyone that invests in the Gulf coast or is interested in investing mm-hmm. these catastrophic areas down here, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, for some reason over the last five years, there has been significant insurance payouts uh, mm-hmm. from a myriad of different storms and I could, don't even I couldn't tell you how many insurance companies were down here, but I know it was a plethora in order to keep things competitive and keep the prices where they were. But literally in just the last six to 12 months, all but three companies have decided that they are no longer going to insure properties in catastrophic zones. Mm-hmm. Only three of them actually have the capacity at this point to do so because the rest of them have either gone bankrupt. They don't have enough money. They were paying way, way too much out and all these uh, claims. Mm-hmm. And so they're saying, we're just not going to do it anymore. So if you want to get a single company to come in and do it, there's only three companies that do it, or you can do what some form of like, it's, it's called like a step up or a master plan or something like that. But for one property, you could have one company come in and give you $2 million of coverage. Then another company and give you 2 million, another company and give you 2 million. Then you have three companies. You've got a total of 6 million, but it's three different companies Mm -hmm. because they don't all individually have the capacity to give you the $6 million of coverage. And if you do something like that, your premium is even more significantly higher. So that's not advised. The advised thing to do is either to get a master plan where you've got a myriad of different properties across the coast or across wherever, across your entire portfolio, and you funnel all of those properties into one master plan with one insurance company, because mm-hmm. then they're going to take into account all the different locations to give you a discounted premium. Um, but I'm getting on tangents now. What we've seen is that because there's only three companies now along the Gulf Coast, our premiums have two, three, sometimes even four X wow. on insurance insurance premiums. Yeah. Uh, and that's literally, it literally happens like overnight. Like they, the policy is about to come to an end on a property that we own in the area. And that company either says, A, we're going to drop you. Like we, we, I just don't even care to insure you anymore. Or B, uh, your premium is, you know, doubling or tripling. Like, whereas you were paying 40,000, hey, it's 80,000 now. You're just yeah. like, 
why, you know, why is it so insane? Mm -hmm. Um, So that's definitely been a big thing for us. If we're looking at properties along the Gulf coast and I'm underwriting a deal and they're paying for the same example, let's say they're paying $40,000 a year currently in insurance. uh, One thing you're always going to want to check too, even outside of this uh, fluctuation here Mm -hmm. and what we're seeing in pricing is you're going to want to make sure that that insurance coverage that they have is actually sufficient for what you'll need. So mm-hmm. when you're doing the underwriting and they're like, yeah, they're paying 40,000. Great. We're going to pay 40,000. Well, what if they're massively underinsured, you know? So right. you want to make sure you're covered from that regard. But on the flip side, as just a quick, like when I'm just doing a quick underwriting to see if I'm even interested in the deal in the first place, I'm doubling everything. So mm-hmm. if they're my new pro forma, what I'm going to be buying at where my offer price is when I'm going running through those expense line items, the insurance is double. Whatever it is, they're paying 40. Nope, I'm going to be paying 80 because that's just where the insurance companies are at right now. So Mm -hmm. it's definitely making things a lot more difficult to find deals that pencil out. uh, And it's just going to be another lever that we'll be able to utilize, hopefully to get a little bit more creative. And hopefully, honestly, for a lot of these, a lot of these sellers to start realizing that where they thought the cap rate was or where they think the cap rate is, isn't actually where the cap rate is. Because a lot of times, People say cap rates move with interest rates, but honestly, cap rates haven't moved much at all and interest rates continue to rise. So it's still, again, it's that hand grenade effect of there's like this massive delay here. But what I think is very interesting is that there's this massive cap rate spread across different asset classes. So over the last two to three years, if you've been buying deals or if you've been involved in the multifamily market in any form or fashion, you know that it didn't matter if you were looking at an A, B, or C class asset, you were buying at a four cap, right? Everything was a four cap, didn't matter. Like everything was so compressed, so competitive, it was ridiculous. So what I think we're going to see over the course of the next six to 12 months is I think A class properties aren't going to fluctuate much at all. If if anything, may stay at four, may go to four and a half, maybe five, depending on your market. Mm -hmm. I think B is definitely going to start, it's going to come back down to where it was pre-COVID. We're going to see those at five, six, maybe even seven. Wow. And then I think C is going to be the massive mover. We're going to see that at six, seven, possibly even eight, because it was eight and nine percent pre-COVID for us in the market that we were in, all our C-class assets that we bought last year. And okay. so I'm I'm really curious to see those assets go back to the realistic price points. Uh, sellers are either going to have to swallow that pill and sell it at that discount, even though it wasn't really a discount. I'm sure they're still going to make money as long as they bought right uh, pre-COVID. Um, But if they didn't, then there's going to be a lot more opportunity for us, right? For the folks out there actually looking to buy, because as their cap rate has hope has probably significantly compressed over the next six to 12 months, that there is going to change where their actual valuation is. So they're either going to just hold on to it if they have the capacity to, or if they're also in a hurt locker from a debt perspective, because another interesting metric is that 70% of all multifamily deals were done with bridge debt. Yep. over the last like two to three years. Yeah. So those adjust I, and or they, have, they either come due or they adjust, right? Yeah. Either right. they have some form of an extension, like a, a one year or two year extension they can utilize or they don't. And they're, they're in a hurt locker. They have to sell cap rates have gone back up to where they didn't think they were going to go. And now you're going to get this super deeply discounted opportunity. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, that's just where, that's where I'm starting to see things. And that's a lot of the, fluctuation that one I, I foresee coming over the next six to 12 months, mm-hmm. of course, no crystal ball here, but, yep. um, but then two things that I'm actually seeing currently and what we're doing with our underwriting things that we're having to shift in order to actually make deals pencil, which mm-hmm. I'm going to be honest, I've analyzed probably 50 deals in the last two weeks and not a single one of them is penciled. Mm. Right. I think it's-, it's just because a lot of these sellers haven't realized that the prices need to come down. Yeah. Yeah. Because your cost of doing the deal has gone up, you know, mm-hmm. through, through the interest rate, uh, through in your case, insurance, uh, adjustments and, you know, sellers, they're going to have to start getting realistic and brokers are going to have to start getting realistic with their sellers, uh, and educating them on what's, what's happening. And, uh, you know, we're working with a broker in Columbus who, really gets this whole thing and gets this aspect of the business where, you know, he's coaching his sellers to adjust and pivot. I mean, we're not talking about a quarter percent or even a half percent 
rise in interest rates. In, in some cases, we're talking about a full point, sometimes a little more. Um, and that's huge. I mean, that's, that's the difference between a deal working and a deal not working. Uh, and so, yeah, it's going it, to, it, it's going to happen. I agree with you that it, that cap rates have not really moved. Um, I like hearing your predictions around or projections around the different asset classes and how they may or may not move. We we're moving into acquiring a stuff right now. We we've got one that we're going to be closing and then we're in highest and best on another one. And we're trying to source more and more class A deals. Um, and it's kind of reassuring to hear you say that you don't think they're going to, the cap rates will move much with, with class A. And I think, I think you're right. Um, and then, you know, class C was getting crazy, man. I mean, people were paying the same cap rates for class C as they were for class A. And right. so it's got to adjust for sure. Yeah. It's like, if, if I'm going to pay this price point, I might as well get a class A asset. It's yeah. going to be the same, it's same, same the returns that I would get for a much nicer property. Yeah. Um, and so I think if you're holding for the long term with a cl- that, like I'm I'm saying all this just to give you perspective of where the market is, uh, where I believe the market to be headed um, in terms of new opportunity, but also what's going to be possible in, in the future with mm-hmm. creative financing and everything else. And so I think if you're still looking to do C class, because we are, we're still going to do B and C class, that's always been our bread and butter. And it's worked great for us because we have a long term hold model. I think mm-hmm. if you're holding for the long term, right, doesn't matter if, right. cap, if cap rates move. If you bought it a four cap and suddenly overnight it goes up to an eight cap, if you're going to hold on to that asset for another ten years, I'm sure it's going to fluctuate again by It'll the time back you, down, yeah. you go to do anything that you need to do. Or yeah. if you're just looking to cash flow it, if it just continues seeing the cash flow, then the cap rates doesn't really affect you much at all unless you're needing to do some form of a refinance or something of the sort, right? Uh, right. So if you're holding for the long term, C class still makes sense, mm-hmm. um, and it's going to continue to make sense, especially as there's more lucrative opportunities, specifically in the B and C class niches, as we progress mm-hmm. um, over the course of the next six to twelve months. Yeah, dude, I can't believe this, but we are up against the hour here, and uh, this has been a very fruitful conversation. We got into some really good stuff around uh, raising capital and investor relations. Um, you know, how to, how to grow your investor base, video testimonials. That's a great one. Um, underwriting. I, this is a great discussion on underwriting. Um, so you're a stud, man. I, I lo- love hanging out with you. I, lo- I love our chances to talk and, uh, really appreciate your, your expertise, but also your, you've got a, a humility about you. I think that's, that's very uh, attractive to be around and, and, uh, you know, you're, you're a good teacher and, and you're passionate about what you're doing. So all those combine to make a hopefully very, very successful guy moving forward. And you, you sure, you're sure off to a, a great start in this space. And, and I mean, not even start at this point, you're well into it. So, um, so yeah, any final words, Joshua, for, for listeners or, or for me for that matter? Um, I would say final words, just being, you mentioned the fact of me being, uh, me being a teacher. Yeah. Uh, I actually started my own mastermind about three months ago. So if you, if you liked what you heard today, if you like the way that I teach, then, um, feel free to reach out to me. You can go on our website, ferraricapital.com, uh, schedule a call with me. We can see if it'd be a good fit for you to basically the whole purpose of the mastermind is it's a multifamily mastermind. So we're teaching you how to start your own company. Do everything we've talked about today and more, especially as there's going to be newer and juicier opportunities over the course of the next uh, six to 12 months. And then the last thing that I have is I don't know when this airs. Um, it, it, when does, I, the next next three weeks, probably. Next three weeks. Perfect. OK, right. so by the time this is aired, this will already be public news, but no one knows this right now. So you'll you'll be in, in the know. Um, I actually put in my uh, two week notice this week. Nice. Uh, and I'm officially going full time real estate investor, officially making enough passive income to more than supplement the lifestyle that we're living. Uh, and so I'll be full time starting August 1st. Dude, that's so exciting. I am so happy for you. Um, that's awesome, man. Good for you. Yeah, you're uh, you're one of like five people that's in the know. I won't tell anyone. <laughs> and then, uh, then we'll tell everyone. Right. So. On, on my last day of work is when I'll post about it and it'll be this big like 
hoorah post. It's been over four and a half. It's been four years and eight months doing this. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm finally here. That's so good, man. Good for you. Remind me again what your W-2 is. I, I, I can't I'm an aircraft technician. I thought it was in the but airline industry. That's right. No yep. more turning wrenches. No more just sopping and sweat. So hot out here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. AC and hanging out with guys like yourself, having a great time, investing in real estate. I'm, I'm super looking forward to it. Listeners, seriously go look at Joshua's mastermind. Like, again, there is no better way other than maybe going to national conferences, but even those, in my opinion, don't have quite the power of a mastermind where you've got a lot of intention, a lot of people that are focused on your success, including Joshua and the other mastermind members. Uh, And if you want to accelerate your curve and really level up like in an efficient way, I think masterminds are tremendous value and uh, you know, whatever it costs is, is a fraction of what you're going to earn through putting deals together with, with other people in the mastermind or learning what you need to learn to, to get the, your deals done. So uh, go check that out. Uh, Josh, what's the web, what's the web address again? Uh, Ferrari capital.com. You yep. basically just go there and schedule a call with me. Um, yep. And then when we'll get on the phone and see if it's, see if you're a good fit for the mastermind. I hate to do it the yep. other way around. I don't want to be like, yeah. Uh, or if the mastermind's a good fit for you. Yeah. I said yeah. it backwards. Yeah. Um, because I think the mastermind could be for anyone, but is it actually right for you in your current situation? Yeah. Um, so love to yeah. chat with you. Love to have you join us. We've currently got 10 students now. One of them's already got a deal under contract in like the first 45 days. Uh, so it's, it's definitely been just this whirlwind of an adventure, literally just over the last two or three months since launching it. Yeah. And think about the power of uh, being in a group of 10 with somebody like Joshua that's in your corner and all 10, all the 11 of those guys are just foc- hyper-focused on you when you're in the hot seat at a mastermind. And they're thinking about how they can add value, what resources they have that could help you, what strategies they have. Like it's extremely valuable work. So, uh, so listeners really do consider that if you want to get real serious in this space and do what Josh was doing and leave your W2, like it's an accelerator for sure. So dude, this has been great. Thanks so much. I uh, really appreciate you coming on. Yeah. hundred percent. Thanks for having me round yeah. two. This was great. Yeah. Round two. This was yeah, totally great. So listeners, thank you. Hope you really enjoyed this. Uh, I, I just, I love Joshua's personality and his, his level of knowledge and, uh, his humility and everything else. So I hopefully was very enjoyable for you. Uh, I know I've, I'm excited about this episode. I can't wait for it to come out. So, uh, so listeners, thanks again, and we will catch you on the next one. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Apartment Gurus with Tate Seymour. Tate and Chelsea are grateful to have you as a loyal listener. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe, rate, and review, and share with friends on your Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or any other podcast platform. Also check out Tate's YouTube channel for videos of many of these episodes and more. Until next time, take massive action steps and rock on.